So, my name's Mark Callum. I'm um, going to give you some lectures on the uh, contribution of genes and genomics to our understanding of human evolution. Uh, I'm actually a microbial genomicist. I study bacterial genomes normally, but I think I know enough about the subject to give you an informed lecture on the subject. This will be part of uh, one of five lectures I'll be giving you on the course. Uh, this is the first one they're waiting the dead. The others are listed, scattering of Africa, looking at something of the world, wandering gene, and then phylogenetics of cancer. I suppose this door is surprising. Um, one of the things I'm going to be doing is I want to put everything I do this term into the public domain in terms of lectures. So all of my lectures will go on to YouTube as slidecast. Uh, the slides will go on to SlideShare. I haven't done it yet, but I will set up a Bio380 Facebook page. Uh, and I'll start using a Twitter feed with that hashtag, Bio380. Okay, so any communications to do with these lectures will go through all those channels. Having said all that, I've done the one wrong thing already which is I haven't got round to giving you handouts. I haven't actually got them printed. I will bring the handouts for this lecture to the next lecture, so you will get them. My excuse is I've been very busy with the Great Wheat of Birmingham Initiative, which you may have heard of on the book of all the first years ago. Um, yesterday, we had Chris Stringer come, who is the world's fur well, the country's foremost expert on these issues. Um, and I've had to update my lecture based on what he said yesterday. Uh, and it's actually so up to date, it's kind of red hot in terms of the stock press. So that's my excuse for not having a handout. Uh, you'll have to judge whether that's a good one. The other thing I will do is um, I'll put up a, uh, a podcast of the lecture as well. So you'll be able to download it as an MP3 file. So if you want to listen to it while you're jogging or something like that uh, later in the term to remind yourself, you can do that. So here are the learning outcomes. At the end of this lecture, you should be able to answer the question of who are the Neanderthals, and were they, what's their relationship to us, and what we'd be expecting to be able to do on this issue is evaluate the evidence from genes and gene sequences, evaluate the evidence more recently from genome sequences, and also, uh, and this is the stop press stuff, which we've had to change since last year, because this subject is so fast moving, we'll also expect you to be able to describe the contribution of other archaic hominids to the human gene pool. I didn't say also, this, this, these lectures obviously follow on from the two I gave last year, which kind of placed humans uh, uh, in, in, in terms of their relationship to uh, living animals, showed us that the chimpanzee was our closest relative, and looked at some of the genes that made us human. We're now fast forwarding in history uh, to the recent, uh, say, last million years or so of human evolution. So, how many of you, this bit of audience participation, how many of you think that you might have Neanderthal ancestry? Does anyone want to put their hand up and say that they have Neanderthal ancestry? None of you at all? Really? There's a couple there. Two, two women there who say that they might have Neanderthal ancestry. Okay, well, we'll reevaluate that when we come to the end of the lecture and see how likely it is. But let's get back to basics. So what, is, what do we mean by Neanderthal? Well, Neanderthal is actually the name of a valley. It just means Neander Valley in German. Uh, it's out here near Dusseldorf. Um, it's named after a, a pastor called Neumann, and they just, I know, being pretentious, they turned it into Greek and called it Neander, which is just Neumann, Neumann in Greek. Uh, and Tal was just a name for, for valley. Unfortunately, the Germans actually modernised their spelling in the 20th century, and Tal with an H lost its H, so it's now called Neanderthal, T-A-L. And our American colleagues, because they're difficult individuals and they like changing spellings, have adopted Neanderthal the H, without the H as their spelling, whilst on this side of the Atlantic we still put the H in. Very annoying, because if you go to PubMed and you do literature searches, you have to use both terms to be certain of getting that's about all the literature. It's one of those annoying things. Um, and the old form is still using taxonomy. So if you wish to use a Latin binomial to describe the Neanderthals, we describe them as Homo neanderthalensis, and that has the H in because taxonomies are very um, 
conservative field. Uh, so that's the background. So as Germany started to industrialize and wanted lime from the limestone of, that, of the valley, the end of the valley, they started uh, quarrying. And there are lots of little caves and rock shelters. There was one that was called the Kleiner Feldhof Grotte uh, in this valley. And in the 1850s, they started quarrying. This is firm Beckershoff and Pieper. And they started removing those caves and the valley walls. And in August 1856, they found this skull cap here. And there's been what we call post cranial bones, bones from other parts of the skull apart from the head, uh, from this particular uh, cave. Now, initially, they were thought to be a cave bear, uh, but they were shown to a local teacher who was also a kind of amateur nat uh, natural historian, Fulrock. And he said, no, these are human. And they were written up a, a, a year later by Fulrot uh, and another academic, Sch uh, Schafhausen, uh, uh, as Neanderthal man. And this first <coughs> specimen, Neanderthal 1, became the top <coughs> specimen for this new, newly named species, <coughs> no, Neanderthalensis. But, as often is the case in science, this was not the first discovery of Neanderthals, although we take the name from this discovery. There were these uh, prequels, if you like. There was uh, a skull from Gibraltar in 1848 and one from Belgium in 1829, uh, which also now we know are Neanderthals. And here's, um, oh, duplicated a bit of the slide there, but uh, in fact, this one from Gibraltar, uh, very interestingly, this skull was actually shown to Darwin, taken to Down House, and Darwin actually handled it. And here it is on the uh, on one pound coin from Gibraltar, celebrating the discovery of that. A Neanderthal skull there. Now that was uh, back in the middle of the 19th century. A few years ago, some scientists went back to that original site and thought, can we see if we can find any more specimens? And they did this wonderful thing. They went and looked around at all the local landmarks. And they looked at old engravings from back in the 19th century and they lined them up and tried to work out where that original site was, because everything had been just destroyed by the mining. But they were able to kind of work out where it was, and they started digging. The, the cave itself was just, would have been destroyed even in, in the middle of the 19th century. But what they were looking for was all the stuff that had just been chucked away during earlier excavations, and they found it. And they went in there, and they found additional Neanderthal specimens. And one of the most remarkable things about this story, it was published a, a few years ago in PNES, was that they actually found a piece of bone from the new excavation that fitted perfectly, like a jigsaw, with stuff that had been dug up 150 years earlier. So it's a you know, remarkable story that they actually managed to find this stuff and dig it out again. Actually, if you look over the, the whole of the last 150 years, we now have over 400, maybe over 500 different Neanderthal specimens. And you can see here are some skulls and some skeletons. Uh, probably only, I think the, we were discussing this yesterday on the way to a Balti house, I think there was about uh, only a dozen or two dozen skulls of Neanderthals that are actually of this quality, but there are lots of other fragments out there. So we have a very rich uh, uh, repertoire of Neanderthal remains available to us. And these have come from all over Europe, uh, and all the way down to, to, to the Mediterranean, down to Gibraltar, up from the southern extremity, up way up into, into to Britain and, and uh, uh, the lowlands, Netherlands, parts of Germany, out into Eastern Europe, uh, and in, even into uh, Palestine uh, uh, over the years. So it's clear that the Neanderthals were quite scattered. Uh, as, uh, as individuals, and in fact, overlapped with modern humans. Here are some reconstructions of what they look like. So, the uh, bit of stuff we had from many years out earlier you know, talks to the idea that Neanderthals are very primitive people, and we use the term Neanderthal pejoratively. We're talking about some idiotic uh, sort of <coughs> now that drinks too much or whatever. This is the kind of brutish the reconstruction that was done uh, early on. Here are some more kind of sympathetic reconstructions. This one particularly, from the University of Zurich, particularly a uh, sympathetic reconstruction of a Neanderthal child, um, suggesting they weren't that different from us. Uh, and um, 
actually they were uh, they probably uh, don't deserve this uh, idea of being an unsophisticated group. They had many aspects of culture um, and intelligence. Their brains were the same size as ours, if not larger. Um, so they get a bad press. If we look at the timeline, the first Neanderthal uh, features appear about uh, 350 years, uh, 350,000 years ago, uh, and then full-blown Neanderthals go from around 130,000 years ago uh, down to about 30,000 years. Uh, there's some arguments about dating. Maybe they survived as long as, uh, as to as recently as 24,000 years ago. Now they overlap in time and range with anatomically modern humans, people like us, who look like us. Uh, but in fact, they never live together. You never find a site where there's you know, uh, humans and Neanderthals buried together or whatever. But they generally overlapped. Um, so it's interesting. There, there was the potential for interaction to occur of, of various sorts, whether social or, as we might see later, even sexual interaction might have been possible. They had their own culture, this so-called Mousterian culture. They used tools, they used fire, they buried their dead, uh, they skinned animals and, and, and used their hides and so forth. And some of the Neanderthal remains have quite severe trauma uh, marks on them. Some of them, the trauma is actually what's killed the individual, but sometimes you get individuals who survive for long periods of time and you see uh, signs of healing of traumatic injury suggesting that they cared for each other. There was some kind of framework in which um, people who were less able uh, were actually looked after by their um, uh, other family members or the members of their social group. In fact, there's one individual who actually had an amputated arm, uh, a serious head injury, probably had uh, paralysis down one side and had an amputation of the arm, but that had healed. The individual had survived for some time after. They were generally carnivorous, um, and if you look at those traumatic injuries, it's been described that they are actually similar to what you see in rodeo. Uh, people do, who were doing rodeo uh, at rodeo riders, and it, it's like that these people were engaged in hunting and chasing, um, and actually a lot of rough and tumble uh, in, in, in that chase. There's this question about whether they were cannibals, and it's some. Um, Remains have been found where it looks as if they, <coughs> the human remains or the Neanderthal remains have been butchered. Counter argument is well, maybe it wasn't that bad where they were eating each other. It was perhaps ritual defleshing, which you do see in some societies where they want to turn a corpse into a skeleton very quickly so they scrape off all the, all, all the, the muscles. But I think the balance of evidence, speaking to Chris String yesterday, is actually, yeah, they probably were ca uh, cannibals at times. They were anatomically distinct from us. Um, and in fact, these differences are quite, you know, they're more than, say, the differences between two uh, chimpanzee species. Uh, you can see they have this uh, brow ridge here, so called supraorbital torus, large nasal cavity, but hardly any chin, kind of chinless wonders, if you like. Uh, they have at the back of the neck, at the back of the head, this so called occipital bun. And the skeleton in general is much more robust uh, than what we see in anatomically. So, so you know, we look weedy compared to them. They look uh, muscular and, and uh, they would probably win in, in weightlifting competitions and wrestling competitions if they were competing with us now. So the brow ridge, mid face, elongated skull. Uh, and they. They certainly, in terms of brain size, they overlap with us, and in fact, they're probably just, on average, slightly larger brain size than us. Um, uh, so, an interesting variation on the theme of, of, of humanity. And the, what happened to them? This is one of the big enigmas. We coexisted with them for 15, at least 15, 20,000 years. So, what happened? <coughs> Did they get wiped out by them? Was there some kind of genocide? Sort of thing we saw when Europeans went to um, the New World. Was there a gradual extension? They couldn't adapt to the end of glaciation, couldn't compete with humans in, in hunting. One adaptation that sometimes is flagged up is that humans seem to be adapted for long distance running, and maybe 
that gave us the edge. We could actually hunt animals for longer, chase them down, exhaust them. Um, but of course, maybe they didn't go extinct. Maybe they just got assimilated, sucked up into the larger population of Anatomically Modern Humans. And this is the, the red hot question which we will return to uh, in a few minutes' time. Here's a couple of papers just to um, illustrate the point. What I will do also, I haven't got it yet, I've got them, but I will put up PDFs of all the papers that I mentioned. In the past when I've done that, people will suddenly panic and say, you've put up 15 papers, so I have to read them all. I'm putting it up there for those who are really interested. I will mark up a couple of papers, two to three papers, that say, well, this is really something you should read. But the rest of it I will put up. So here's... Uh, one where they make arguments about competitive exclusion, they just couldn't compete. Here is one where they're saying that actually, if you look at some of the features, you see some skulls that look a bit like a modern human, a bit like a Neanderthal. Maybe there was interbreeding, and maybe that's what happened, and there was assimilation. Uh, so from the physical evidence and from models, these two possibilities. So what it boils down to was, was there genetic exchange between Neanderthals Now, the, this lecture and the next one actually go as a pair, and it's, it's always difficult to work out which one to give first. But I'll give away the, 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 the conclusion of the second lecture, which is that actually all humans originated, modern humans originated in Africa, and then they diversified and met, and within Africa, and then one population left Africa and populated the rest of the world, uh, in this case, in Eurasia. So the Neanderthals overlapped in, Euro in, in, in Eurasia, time and space, did they just die out, they lived alongside and then they died out, or did actually some of that Neanderthal lineage <coughs> find its way back into the anatomically modern lineage in Eurasia? So they diversified here, but separated out probably about 400 million years ago, 500 million years ago, but there was a rejoining of that lineage. So those are the two alternative views that we might take of this. Which one is true? And I tell you, it's been a role, it's been a kind of helter skelter uh, uh, of ideas in answer to that question over the last few years. So, what can sequences tell us about all this? Well, one thing we can do is we can go out and sample the populations that are currently out there and look at genetic diversity and say, are there any kind of signatures out there in modern populations that suggest that there had been admixture from another population? So if you look in Europeans, are there sequences that you can find that are not found elsewhere, not found in Africans, that seem to be quite old, that might have been that, that kind of smoking gun of Neanderthal assimilation into European populations? And a couple of papers in the 1990s looked at this and said, nope, can't find any evidence of that. Nope. Looks like Europeans are just Africans that have gone a bit tired. Then, um, in the last few years, the last decade or two, we've actually looked at ancient DNA. So, people have tried to get DNA out of Neanderthal samples uh, and looked at the sequences of those, those DNA samples they get. The problem with this is it relies on amplification or retrieval of sequences from fossils, and there's a big problem of contamination with modern human DNA. So if you're handling a Neanderthal specimen, your own DNA is coming off on your skin scales, your hair, uh, scalp, hair, all that, getting into the, into the specimen. And if there's infinitesimal amounts of Neanderthal DNA, they're going to get swamped by the, the DNA from the handler, which can create big problems. So we have to be very careful about this problem of contamination with human DNA and careful in drawing conclusions from anything we find. One of the main targets that's being used, that was certainly used initially, was mitochondrial DNA. Uh, and there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, it's found in multiple copies, hundreds or thousands of copies per cell. So in proportion to the nuclear genome, each gene in the nuclear genome you might have two copies of it, but here you've got many more, more copies. There's this part of the uh, mitochondrial genome called the D loop which doesn't code for any proteins, and therefore it's, it's a bit, the, uh, the selection is a bit relaxed, so it tends to be much more variable than 
protein coding genes. So it actually gives you a very nice handle on, on variation. If you can amplify that region, you get some information from it. And the other interesting thing about the mitochondria are that they are transmitted through the maternal line. So there's a very simple, defined way in which they're transmitted. So a mother passes on mitochondria to her sons and daughters. The sons, mitochondria, that lineage doesn't go forward. The daughter's lineage goes forward to that daughter's sons and daughters and so forth. <coughs> So, back in 1997, a man called Svante Parvo, who, alongside the Neanderthals, is pretty much the hero of our story, because he's one of the great uh, pioneers in this field, he and his colleagues uh, produced this paper, where they looked at Neanderthal DNA sequences and said, what does this tell us about the origins um, of modern humans? And they went to the Neanderthal type specimen, that was found back in um, 1856, um, and uh, use the polymerase chain reaction, I'm assuming that you have a vague idea what the PCR is, uh, they used that to actually get bits of DNA, mitochondrial DNA out. Um, and they did lots of controls to check that it wasn't human contamination, and they sequenced those. And what they found was that the um, Neanderthal sequence sat well outside the range of variation that was seen so all the samples that are being taken from Africans and non-Africans, uh, you can see here, and Neanderthals were there as an outgroup. So um, as it says that the, the, the common ancestor of Neanderthal and modern human mitochondrial DNA was about four times greater than that of the common ancestor of all the known human mitochondrial DNAs. And as it says, this suggests that, that the Neanderthals just went extinct, and that was it. We are separate lineage, they're a separate lineage, we never met, but we never mixed. Um, this just shows you, you know, they just took a small piece of, of humerus um, and managed to extract DNA from it to get this, uh, these results. Uh, another paper followed shortly afterwards, a, few, a little while after, looking at um, much larger numbers. So here they looked at 24 Neanderthal uh, samples and 40 uh, early modern human remains. Um, as it says here, four Neanderthals and five of the modern humans were good enough to suggest preservation of DNA. All four of the Neanderthals re uh, revealed sequences. Um, and these were uh, similar to the ones that had already been found, and they all lay outside the variation that we've seen in modern humans. So this excludes any large genetic contribution of Neanderthals to early modern humans. But, you know, they've been careful, they said, but does not rule out the possibility of a smaller contribution. Now, you, you, you could argue, well, maybe the Neanderthal DNA looks different because it's so old, and that DNA is getting degraded and mutated as in the soil or in these samples, uh, and, and that's why it looks different. Uh, and maybe there's a consistent way in which it gets degraded, which means it, it looks consistently different. Well, this paper looked at that one, looked actually at some Cro-Magnon early modern human uh, DNA, and showed that it was different from all the ones that anyone had handled it, but was recognisably within the range of modern humans. So just it, because the DNA is old, it does not make it different. <coughs> Um, and, and similarly, here's a, another paper where they looked at uh, uh, Neanderthals and modern humans and found the same issue here, uh, that, you, that the mitochondrial DNA for these individuals fell well within the range of variation for today's humans, but differed sharply from the available sequences of the chronologically closer Neanderthals. This discontinuity is diff difficult to reconcile with the hypothesis that both Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans contribute to the current European gene. So again, good evidence that there was no intermixing, that we were separate lineages, some might even say separate species. Interestingly, uh, as time went on, it became clear that Neanderthals actually had ranged much further than people thought. Uh, in particular, they were, remains were found all the way out here in Siberia. Um, and DNA was extracted from those, mitochondrial DNA sequences were obtained, um, and, but even that far away in Siberia, 
the Neanderthal sequences were falling within the same kind of range of the other Neanderthal sequences and clearly fell outside the, uh, the range of, of modern humans. So as of uh, 2007, looking at me, uh, Neanderthal sequences, we're now st stacking up this long list of them. Um, and here, shown in colour, at the top there is CRS stands for Cambridge Reference Sequence. That's the kind of reference sequence for a modern human mitochondrial sequence. And you can see at multiple positions, you get differences in the Neanderthals. All the Neanderthals agree with each other against the the modern human one. So here you can see quite strikingly this, this double A seen here in all the Neanderthals uh, is quite different from the, uh, the GC that's actually seen in, in human, modern humans. So we have a consistent story. We seem to have excluded the possibility of contamination. We have excluded the, the possibility of the DNA being degraded in a consistent way. We're getting a consistent story that the Neanderthal populations were separate. So Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA, quite different from all the pre present human mitochondrial DNA sequences and different from ancient mitochondrial DNA sequences from anatomically modern humans. So they look like us, but they're very old, tens of thousands of years, but they still have mitochondrial DNA. Yeah. So this is two, you know, common interpretation. This means there are two separate species, calling them homo neanderthalensis, justified, little or no admixture, and it's consistent with this hypothesis, which we'll be speaking about in the next lecture in more detail, the out of Africa hypothesis that, that Europeans and other non Africans originated in one exit, exodus from Africa um, and replaced the existing populations rather than mixing with them. Then it all changed. In November 2006, this guy, Svante Pavo, uh, started actually getting autosomal <coughs> genome sequence data out of samples. Uh, and it, as it says here, the dawn of Stone Age genomics. Uh, uh, out of the veil of death were over one million Neanderthals in their genes. Very dramatic uh, uh, discoveries coming out of, of this. Um, and two papers appeared back to back, uh, looking at very large numbers of uh, Neanderthal sequences. One of them here, one million bases. This one here, 65 kilobases or so. So dwarfing all those previous efforts that, that had been done with mitochondrial DNA by a considerable margin. So what did they say? They said, well, we have a common ancestor, about seven, this one said about um, 700,000 years ago, with possibly splitting about 300, four, well, about 400,000 years ago. This one said about 500,000 years ago, roughly at the same kind of, 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 of figure. Now, I haven't got time to go into details, but they took a great deal of care to make sure that they were not fooling themselves in detecting mitochondrial sequences. They made comparisons between chimpanzee genome, modern human genome, Neanderthal genome, and so forth. And you can read the papers if you want to go into detail there. What about the admixture issue? Well, the verdict in two papers was subtly different. Um, one of them said... That with it, that set various assumptions. With these assumptions, the maximum likely estimate for Neanderthal contribution to modern genetic diversity is zero. However, a 95% confidence in this estimate range is 0 to 20%. So a definitive answer to the admixture question will require additional Neanderthal sequence data. This one uh, said that this that they, they were more definitive. They said that Nonetheless, this high level of derived alleles in Neanderthal is incompatible with the simple population split model. Suggests, it may suggest gene flow between modern humans and Neanderthals. Um, uh, more extensive sequencing is necessary. So, hadn't ruled out the issue completely. One paper was a bit more saying, yeah, it's likely. The other one was saying, not really that likely. Next development was to actually get an entire mitochondrial genome sequence. Uh, around 16 kilobases of sequence, uh, much larger uh, than the <coughs> fragments we've had before. Uh, interestingly, they found some uh, changes in the coding sequences there. Uh, one in this particular COX-2 gene, uh, there were some differences there, which is speculated might actually be adaptive, that maybe this was the way the, the, the Neanderthals ran their mitochondria in a way that was made them better 
and fitter in these cold uh, northern European environments. Uh, whether that's true or not is another matter, but there clearly were differences uh, in these. Um, now, but the other thing they said, though, when in, in that paper, was they actually reappraised uh, the previous sequencing efforts. And they came up with this conclusion, which is that in one of those two experiments, contamination with modern human DNA had occurred. So although they've taken every chance they could to try and avoid that, they had actually had some contamination going on. So the, the area was still up in just in, in, you know, in, in, in a state of confusion as to whether this issue had been addressed properly or not. Continual movement forward, though. After one mitochondrial genome, we next had five Neanderthal mitochondrial genomes from a variety of sites spanning a large part of their range. And when you look at the, the whole mitochondrial genome sequence, you get the same picture that you got when you just looked at little fragments of sequence. The mitochondrial genomes of Neanderthals lay outside the variation we see within modern humans. So in modern humans, we can see there's African and the non-African populations there, and Neanderthals way, way, well away in terms of variation. So it's Darwin's 200th birthday. February 2009, February 12th, and on that day, not by accident, obviously by design, they decided to release a press release saying they had now a one times coverage draft sequence of the Neanderthal genome. What that actually means is they probably had about 60% of the genome. Um, and a remarkable undertaking, they had sequenced 68.9 billion bases to get that, uh, to cull out three billion bases of Neanderthal genome. So most of what they found, it's not that surprising when you're taking these samples that have been in the soil for so long and in caves for so long. Most of it was bacterial. In fact, most of it was junk. It couldn't even be identified as whatever it was. But the things that could be identified, most of them were bacterial. But in there, hidden in there, were clearly human DNA sequences and they were fished out. Um, and they managed to recover this Neanderthal genome. And they found, looking at coding sequences, there were about 1,000 to 2,000 amino acid differences from anatomically modern humans. So to give some context, between humans and chimps, there's about 50,000 such differences. They said that they found no evidence of admixture in this press release, and no evidence of recently emerging non-African variants. So there's a bit of controversy. Some, some people have, were saying that the African that the non-Africans had certain genes which made them smarter and all that. There's a lot of big trouble with this kind of uh, viewpoint. And they said, actually, there's no evidence for that with these Neanderthals. And uh, in fact, that whole stuff has been stretched out anyway. Divergent state, looking a bit further back to 800,000 years ago. And um, we're all very excited about when was the formal publication going to come out and tell us this in a peer-reviewed scientific paper. We had to wait a little while, a few months, well, in fact, a year nearly, over a year, uh, before we got this uh, through my mental arithmetic. So it was a, it, it went over a year, but 15 months or so. And then this came out. And this overturned our expectations yet again. Uh, this time, they um, said that comparisons of Neanderthal genome to the genomes of present-day humans from different parts of the world identify a number of genomic regions that may have been affected by positive selection in ancestral modern humans, including the genes involved in metabolism and in cognitive and skeletal development. But also, we show that Neanderthals shared more genetic variants with present-day humans in Eurasia than with present-day humans in sub-Saharan Africa suggesting that gene flow from Neanderthals into the ancestors of non-Africans occurred before the divergence of Eurasian groups from each other. Now, the strange thing, the thing that they didn't expect, everyone said, well, you know, maybe Neanderthals went with the ancestors of Europeans. What they actually found was that everyone who came from out of Africa had some Neanderthal admixture, and none of the Africans did, or compared to, certainly compared to the Africans. So, um, that was a strange thing. So Chinese people 
out Neanderthal DNA, Papua New Guineans, Australians, all that, would, you'd expect there to be Neanderthal admixture in there, which was something quite unexpected, really. Um, when you looked at the genome and looked at sort of things that might have some functional uh, meaning, here were some examples. You look at the chimp genome, look at anatomically modern human genomes, 78 base substitutions that change protein sequences uh, in, in our lineage. So that kind of helps work out you know, what makes us different from the Neanderthals. You might put it in chauvinist views, you know, what made us more successful, what made us smarter, and so forth. And here are some of the genes that have been listed now. We're not we don't know the functional significance of this. But you can see axonine protein, something to do with the nervous system, maybe. That's got something to do with it. Some of the others are known, we don't really know what they mean. But the copy number changes as well. Um, so you could actually, there was enough depth of coverage for you to be able to work out that there were multiple copies of something in Neanderthals compared to humans, modern humans. Uh, another interesting thing that you could do once you had the Neanderthal genome is you could actually look for what are called selective sweeps, where one particular allele comes in and replaces everything in the whole population. So let's just imagine that that red star there is, so red hair, uh, that maybe you know, everyone in the population suddenly becomes red-headed because there's a selective advantage to it. Or in fact, if you look further along, you know, having a white skin in the European environment, might have a selective advantage. So you get this selective sweep where all the previous variations just got rid of and that new uh, allele becomes fixed. Having the Neanderthal sequence allowed us to kind of identify uh, some of those things that were going on. So Neanderthals, as I say, fall with, with, in some parts of their genome, they fall within the variation within modern humans. And this uh, allows us to look for these genes. And so there are some uh, genes that were identified there uh, that might have uh, changed dramatically uh, in humans. Um, some of them associated with skull differences, perhaps genes in, uh, implicated in cognitive ability. Now, much of this, it, it's, it's kind of hand-waving. I'm deliberately hand-waving because... Although we have these differences, we really don't know if they actually make any difference at all. Some of them could just be noise, uh, nothing to do with the major biological differences and social differences. But somewhere in that pattern, there, ma there must be an explanation for why we're different. And it's exhilarating to think we will get there. So coming back to the discussion, are Neanderthals more closely related to some anatomically modern humans than to others? And what they did, they compared the uh, derived, or derived SNP single treatment type polymorphisms in Neanderthals and uh, anatomically modern humans. Um, and they compared Neanderthal with two European Americans, two East Asians, uh, and four West Africans. <coughs> and they, what they found was that Neanderthals were significantly closer to non Africans, to the East Asians and the Europeans rather than the West uh, Africans. Um, uh, and this was, they looked at San, the Bushman from Southern Africa, Yoruba from West Africa, Han, Chinese, uh, major Chinese ethnic group, French people, and Papuans from Papua New Guinea. Um, and they showed that the flow, by doing that carefully, they could show that actually what happened was that the flow come from Neanderthals to non-African humans. Because you could have identified that way, you could have said that the flow was from modern humans into Neanderthals, but that careful comparison showed that. Uh, and Craig Venter, who was the first anatomically modern human to have his full diploid genome sequence. When you looked at his genome, you could see some parts of him were more Neanderthal than they were African in terms of his genome. In terms of the amount, up to about 4% of non-African genomes are Neanderthal. So coming back to that question we asked earlier, pretty much everyone in here, I don't see anyone of exclusively African, modern African origin. So everyone in this room has got Neanderthal ancestry. Um, not much, but it's there. So, drawing this uh, diagrammatically, we have Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans diverging 400, 500,000 years ago. Anatomically modern humans then diverging. We know that the San, and we'll talk about this in a later lecture, the San, the Bushman, were one of the first groups to diverge a long, long time ago, maybe 100,000 years ago, in West African group. And then 
all the out of Africa groups, the Papuans, the Chinese, the Europeans. And what you, we find is a clear signature of Neanderthal admixture into that branch there after it left Africa. Well, actually, I prejudged that. It may not have been after they left Africa, maybe perhaps while they were just waiting at the gates to leave Africa somewhere in Ethiopia or Eritrea or whatever. We don't know for certain that they only met outside of Africa. Um, uh, and, but we don't have any evidence of Neanderthals in Ethiopia at the moment, but as they were in Palestine, it's not that far. But uh, certainly uh, that was what happened, that, that there were those two populations met somewhere and, and there was a small degree of interbreeding. Well, when we say small, I mean 5%, 4 or 5% is actually a consider fairly reasonable number. So the next question is having all this genome data from Neanderthals, can it tell us what they look like? Can it tell us anything about what they were really like? Were they like this brutish man here? Or can we actually find uh, something a bit more sophisticated in there? And in fact, there are a number of uh, things that have been done. This one actually predates all the genome stuff. Uh, it was actually done on direct kind of analysis of molecules in Neanderthal remains. But it shows that um, we, we basically have... Um, <coughs> This uh, particular gene, CMP M acetylneuraminic acid hydroxylase, inactivated in our lineage compared to chimpanzees. It's one of those signatures that separates anatomically modern humans uh, from other primates. Uh, and if you look, at what it means is you get this different decoration of sugar molecules on the surface of cells. Um, and you see these twin peaks here in the orang, the bonobo. And the chimp, but it's lacking in humans. When this is applied to the Neanderthals, there was actually a small, uh, sorry, there was no, that's just a bit there was no peak there, uh, but there was a large peak corresponding to the other major uh, sugar moiety, this new 5A, uh, 5A C, which is uh, found in, in humans and other animals. So um, Neanderthals were like us in that regard. People looked at the pigment receptors, particularly this one melanocortin-1 receptor, um, which accounts for some of the variation in pigmentation in modern humans, and they found indeed there were mutations in some Neanderthals, which inactivated this receptor or at least uh, damped down its activity. And the interpretation of that is that probably some Neanderthals had red hair or ginger hair. As uh, Chris Stringer pointed out yesterday, many of the tabloids put up pictures of ginger spice alongside the Neanderthals and said, oh, look, you know, there's a relationship. The interesting thing is that the mutations that made the Neanderthals go ginger are different from those that are found in modern European populations that have made people go ginger in, in modern populations. So, uh, very interesting uh, variation uh, on a theme there. And here's a couple of other, uh, other papers. This is a growing area, and we're going to see many papers coming out over the next few years, I'm sure. Um, but uh, if you look at humans, we, we have a polymorphism. Some people can taste a particular bitter molecule, and others cannot. Uh, and it's down to a very particular change in, in, in the one gene, this class uh, 2R38 gene. And you can see polymorphisms also in the Neanderthals. So they are varied in that. Um, you can look at blood groups, um, and there are variations in blood groups there. Um, uh, in fact, you can detect blood group O uh, in, in the Neanderthals. So it suggests that the, whatever, the mutation that gave rise to blood group O in us actually predated our divergence in Neanderthals. Um, and we're going to learn a lot more about FOXP2, but this is a gene implicated in speech um, in, in the general sense. Uh, there's some argument about whether it really is a specific speech gene, and some of you might be looking into that in more detail. But in any case, Neanderthals are the same as us uh, in that gene. Okay. Now, last year, the whole subject was thrown into disarray again. What was the disarray? Into the same febrile excitement, I think. Um, uh, because in a cave, in the Denisova cave, in the Altai Mountains, in southern sort of Siberia, they found a finger bone. Um, 
They extract the DNA from the finger bone, they've got like the human and top of the human in the end. They extract the DNA, they've got this mitochondrial DNA sequence out. What they found uh, was that it was quite different from humans, modern humans, and from Neanderthals. So it said represents a hitherto unknown type of hominin mitochondrial DNA that shares a common ancestor with Anton the modern human and Neanderthal about a million years ago. This is just absolutely astonishing that there's just little finger bone, little, the little finger bone, and from that they got this DNA and they were able to make this uh, assertion that there was a completely different lineage, a different kind of human. Now they've got no skulls, nothing to say on this, they've got brown, just like the Neanderthals or any other features. But the genomic data alone, this mitochondrial DNA data alone, is enough to separate the lineages and say there were two lineages. Some people were very skeptical. Uh, in fact, Eugene Scott, who's the head of the NCSE in, uh, in America, National Center for Science Education, she was in a former life an anthropologist, and when she came over last February, she said, oh, don't believe it, you know, show us some proper bones or some morphology, and then we might start believing it. She's, you, know, you can't tell all this just from a few sequences. But it didn't stop there. Uh, sorry, sorry, oh, yes, this is just showing you the, that... Uh, Graphically here is all the modern humans, mitochondrial variation. Here are the old Neanderthals, which we've kind of established as separate in the mitochondrial variation. Denisova is way out here, completely separate. Just to show you where it is, it's up there in uh, southern Siberia. If you're interested in this stuff, did any of you go to John Hawke's lecture? John Hawke came uh, last week. And he actually, a few months ago, went to Dennis over to the cave and had a look around. And he vlogs on that. So go, if you just Google John Hawke, you'll find his blog. A very interesting story about that cave. And then, of course, it, it gets better still, because just a few months ago, we had this paper talking about the genetic history of that, where they actually extracted uh, the whole genome. Not the microns, but the whole genome at 1.9 fold coverage. And it was just astonishing that this... Um, Shares a common origin with Neanderthals, not involved in the gene flow from Neanderthals into Eurasians, but there was some gene flow into modern populations, but into the very distinct group of modern humans, what we call Melanesians, uh, 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 and later we'll see Australians as well, Australian Aborigines. So people who live in Southeast Asia, uh, in that archipelago there, uh, these individuals uh, have a Part of their genome derived from this Denisovan lineage, as they call it. Uh, within the same cave, they found a tooth, and that tooth also had a mitochondrial genome similar to the finger bone, so it wasn't one off. Um, but the tooth had no derived morphological features shared with Neanderthals and modern humans, further indicating that there was this distinct lineage out there that nobody had ever dreamt of before. Um, so we have an even more complex picture now of anatomically modern humans diverse, diverging from the Denisovans first of all, then the Neanderthals. Neanderthals feeding into the non-African populations, the Denisovans feeding specifically into this uh, population that's now affected by people from Papua New Guinea, uh, uh, and just that lineage alone. So a very kind of tangled picture we're getting, not quite a tree uh, anymore. And it's just explosive. I mean, I have to update these lectures every year and every, just before I give them, I have to go and check that nothing's come out. This paper came out a few weeks ago. Uh, it's actually, I don't know if it's actually appeared in print yet, but it came out online a, few, a, a while ago, suggesting that actually some of the uh, alleles in the immune system, uh, the HLA alleles that we see in modern humans, particularly in, in, in West Asia, actually have derived from the Denisovans. So they kind of these although there was a large admixture into one particular population, some things were selected for and then spread through you know a small amount of interbreeding between Papuans and their neighbours and so forth into other uh, populations. Nearly finished now. This is a paper that came out last week. I haven't been able to get hold of the paper but I've managed to read John Hawkes' excellent blog post on it, and he stole one of the pictures from it. 
And what they did there was they looked at a much larger series of populations from Southeast Asia and from Australasia down here. Um, and the black or the pie charts show you what percentage of the genomes of these different populations is, is as much denisovan as that original Papuan uh, population. So it's about 5%, but it's clear that Australian Aborigines have about 5% Denisovan, uh, Papuans have about 5% Denisovan. Some of these other populations from nearby have smaller amounts. But it's clear that people who live in modern-day China, Vietnam, and Russia, they don't have any Denisovan ancestry. So the weird thing is we've got Denisovan, the actual place where we found this uh, archaic genome up there in Siberia, and then these, the closest relatives all the way down here. So it suggests that we, we must have had several waves of population sweeping through here, uh, and that some of these earlier populations were replaced by later populations. And probably the Denisovans weren't just stuck in Siberia, maybe they ranged over a much larger area. And, you know, it's very exciting. There will almost certainly be new developments in the coming year and the coming year and so forth. I've almost finished. It gets even more complicated. So we, you know, we like to have a nice simple picture, but we haven't got one. Because in the last few weeks, there's been two more papers come out. One suggesting that if you... Remember I said earlier, people back in the 90s looked at European population genetics and said, there's nothing funny going on here. No evidence of anything coming in from outside. <coughs> people have looked at African populations more recently, and they've said, actually, look, there is something in West Africa that looks a bit odd. Looks like there's been another population that's been in, in, uh, interbreeding with those people some time ago. And Chris Stringer, just pointed out, he's just had a paper out in POS1 last week where he's looked at two uh, some skulls from um, West Africa that look decidedly archaic, decidedly ancient in their features, don't look like modern human skulls, but they're, only, they're relatively recent, I think 13,000 years old. So it suggests that there was, there is, has been some population in West Africa that survived, like the Neanderthals did in Europe, for long periods of time, kind of separate. So I just stole this from Chris's talk yesterday. Basically, what we now think of is that predecessors of, of modern humans, species Homo erectus, evolved into Homo heidelbergensis, and that was the predecessor of Neanderthals, Denisovans, and Homo sapiens. But there was also, if you can see in Africa, this little lineage that we don't know anything about much, that also branched off. So things are getting decidedly more complex and more interesting than what we first thought. So, conclusion. Neanderthals have, mul we now have multiple uh, uh, mitochondrial DNA sequences. All of those sequences still remain outside the variation of seeing humans, modern humans. The genome sequence suggests that we do have small-scale mixing. We have evidence that Neanderthals have pale skin, human-like fox feet, bitter taste, blood group O, and we now have this other archaic admixture. And we're going to see much more coming. Uh, I just read this morning, looking on Twitter, we can expect sitting balls genome to come out very soon. They've actually got the samples of it, so we'll see a Native American genome in the near future. Uh, it's all going to get very exciting. Are we that surprised? <coughs> We're in the West bloody Midlands, aren't we? This man here, he had his genome sequence a couple of, uh, a, 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 over a year ago, and yeah, he's got Neanderthal DNA. It's not surprising, is it? It's a bloody group, you know. What do we expect? Uh, and you can go and look that up if you like, you know, of the Osborne's genome. Good, that's me finished. If you want a bit of fun, go and look on YouTube, search for Neanderthal Man uh, by Hot Mix. A dreadful, dreadful song, but quite catchy. You can look at it in his art a bit more if you want. I'm going to pull up a list of Chris Stringer's talk from yesterday. Can any of you go to Chris Stringer's talk? One or two. The rest of you, shameless people who went home and went down the pub and said they're coming to that talk, you still can watch it. That's it. <laughs>